and I think we should now move on to the um, uh, to the first speaker of the the first real speaker of the day. Uh, we have two talks before the a, a short break. The first one is by Miora Andriant Sala Sara Laza, a name more difficult than mine, who will be speaking on a deathly project called Destas. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Miura. I'm a PhD student at Uppsala University under the supervision of Sophia Ramstedt. And today I will talk about the first result of the Death Star project on the sizes and asymmetries of the serious circumstellar envelopes of nearby HB stars. Sorry. Um, so in this context, Death Star is short for determining accurate mass loss rate for thermally pulsing HB stars. So as this name indicates, uh, the main goal of the Death Star project is to improve the accuracy of the mass loss rate estimates for HB stars, and this is done by using CO line emission from the circumstellar envelope of HB stars. So the circumstellar envelope is the outermost envelope of an HB star. Um, it is an expanding envelope with a rather constant terminal velocity, and it is mostly made of gas and dust that were ejected by the stellar winds of the HB star. So one of the most reliable ways to estimate mass loss rates is to use a CO line observation from the circumstellar envelope combined with radiative transfer modeling of the observed CO line. So using this method, what we get is the average mass loss rate that created the circumstellar envelope that is probed by the observed line. So that means that if we want to derive the mass loss rate using the CO line emission, we need to know the radius of the circumstellar envelope that actually emits the CO emission that we observe. And in previous studies, this was done uh, using photo dissociation models. So as I mentioned earlier, the circumstellar envelope uh, is com uh, mainly constituting of dust and gas, and one of the most uh, abundant molecules in the circumstellar envelope is CO, which is the line that we want to observe. Uh, and as I also mentioned earlier, the circumstellar envelope is uh, the outermost envelope of an AGB star, so it serves as the border between the star and the interstellar medium. The circumstellar envelope is also the place where it takes place photodissociation photo reactions. Uh, so you have the interstellar radiation from the interstellar medium that will interact with molecules such as CO and that will destroy them. So we are interested in the zone where the CO are um, not destroyed by the radiation from the interstellar medium. So that will be the CO photodissociation radius that I show here as the actual size in green, which is firmly defined as the region where the CO abundance has dropped to half of its initial value. So this is the actual size of the circumstellar envelope. But what we observe is the excited CO. And the CO is not always necessarily excited all the way through the entire circumstellar uh, photo dissociation region of CO, uh, which means that what we actually need uh, and what we observe is the CO emitting circumstellar envelope, which is not always the same as the actual uh, CO photo dissociation circumstellar envelope. And the region of the CO emitting uh, circumstellar envelope will depend on the transition that we observe as uh, that depends on the uh, excitation requirements. So the bottom line is that we are interested in the uh, uh, region that actually emits the CO uh, because we're using the emitted CO line uh, and using the photo dissociation radius that we derived from theory uh, can lead to major uncertainties to the derived mass loss rates. And in addition, this method that I uh, talked about assumes a standard circumstellar envelope that is spherically symmetric. Uh, so it is important for us also to uh, assess how true this assumption is for the stars that we use. Uh, so we need to investigate the morphologies of our uh, the, of the circumstellar envelopes of the stars. As you know, that the morphology of the circumstellar envelope can uh, change depending on whether there is a preferential direction or some other phenomenon that could lead to deviation from spherical symmetry. And as Albert mentioned, that could maybe lead to uh, the different spherical shapes that you, the, that we find uh, in post-AGB stars or planetary nebulae. 
Therefore, the first step of the Death Star project is to constrain the size of the CO emitting circumstellar envelopes. Uh, this is in order to reduce the uncertainties on the mass loss rates uh, and investigate deviation from spherical symmetry in order to assess uh, how uh, valid our assumptions and therefore our method um, is. And for that, we map uh, the uh, uh, CO2 to 1 and CO3 to 2 emission of 69 southern nearby HB stars with the Atacama compact array of the ALMA interferometer. And we use this uh, very compact co configuration in order to resolve the most extended uh, large scale structure of uh, the CO envelope in order to see large scale um, asymmetries and also to see the extent of the CO emission. And our results were published in uh, the two publications of the Death Star project. So we have the first paper that was published last year, uh, which is about the sizes and the symmetries of the envelopes of M and C type HB stars. And the second paper was published this year on the S type HB stars. So what we did is that we fit the brightness distribution of uh, uh, the CO lines with the Gaussian distribution and we get something similar to the plot that you see here, which is an example for the star TG Sen. Um, and we take the size, a first estimate of the size as the major axis of the resulting Gaussian that you can see in blue. And uh, we can uh, estimate deviation from spherical symmetry by comparing the major and minor axis. So the minor axis here is in orange. So as you can see for this particular star, the axis ratio is very close to one. So this star is a uh, very, uh, is in excellent agreement with the uh, function of uh, um, Another thing that we looked into is uh, the position gradient. So we tracked the position of the emission across the channels. Uh, along the right ascension and the declination. So if we have a consistent offset, as you can see in the not so well behaved source above the good one, uh, if we, there is a constant position, um, consistent position gradient like this in our right ascension and declination that could indicate the presence of rotation or some kind of uh, plane parallel expansion. We also looked at line profiles. In particular, we looked at white bases. We could indicate um, the presence of a faster flow, or we look for multiple peaks, which have been in the past linked with the presence of an expanding torus. And we also looked at the generated CO maps to look at the uh, sign up asymmetries in the extended emission of the circumstellar envelopes. So this is the main result that we have on the size. Um, what you the colors that you see represent the different chemical types. So in blue, you have the M-type stars that have more oxygen than carbon. In red, you have the carbon star, the C-type stars that have more carbon than oxygen. And in green, you see the S-type stars that have a ratio of CO around one. Um, on the X, on the Y axis, we have the linear diameter, which then represents the derived sizes. And on the X axis, we have a, a proxy of density given by the mass loss rate divided by the expansion velocity that was derived from previous studies. And the different lines that you see, so the dashed lines uh, represent the CO photo dissociation sizes that I mentioned as actual sizes before. So these are from photo dissociation models. And uh, after running those into radiative transfer modeling for the transition to, to one, we get the solid lines. So the solid lines represent what we expect to observe in CO2 to, to one. So we can compare directly what we observe uh, with those solid lines. Five minutes, Miara. And um, as you can see, uh, the general behavior here is that uh, from the models, you can see that C-type stars are expected to be larger than the S-type stars, which are expected to be larger than the M-type stars. And if you look at first at the low density side of the plot, we can see that uh, our, our data roughly agrees with that sequence in size, uh, but we do notice that the C-type stars are uh, larger than expected. So they are a bit above the, the solid lines and the m type stars are fall, uh, fall below um, the solid line in blue. But the most striking result is for the high density case uh, where we have a steeper dependence and we have S-type stars, four S-type stars that are uh, larger than expected. 
So those stars are larger than what is expected to be observed in CO2 to one, and some of them are even closer to the actual, so the CO4 to dissociation radius. Um, and most importantly, those stars seem um, uh, are larger than the carbon stars for the same density, and that is not expected based on the CO abundance. So we expect the carbon stars to be larger. And having those desktop stars larger than carbon stars is an unexpected result. We don't know the reason for that, but we did look into um, the shapes of those uh, outliers, S-type stars, um, using the methods that I mentioned earlier, and we found that those two stars at the top, the largest stars, show strong signs of asymmetrical features in their large-scale uh, extended emission, whereas those two stars here um, that are also larger than expected uh, have um, a circumstellar envelope that is uh, in good agreement with a spherically symmetric circumstellar envelope. So we have not followed up the sources yet, and we do not know the reason for this. Uh, so uh, better, um, better uh, observations and also more modeling will be necessary to draw pertinent conclusions on why we have this trend. Um, and after investigating the deviation from spherical symmetry of our sources using the methods that I mentioned earlier, we found that about a third of the sources, the 69 sources that we observed, show strong signs of deviation from spherical symmetry uh, in their large scale structures. And this is in agreement with previous um, interferometric surveys, uh, such as binary et al. or by the COSAS project in 2010. And, um, the last thing that I will show is some examples of those uh, sources that show strong deviations from spherical symmetries in our sample. Um, so you have here uh, FUMON and our HITRA that show uh, that uh, uh, are shown the different velocities. So in red, you have the red shifted velocity, in blue, the blue shifted, and uh, in green, you have the central. Um, and you can see the different outflows. So we have opposite of outflows for the red and the blue shifted velocities for FUMON and also for our uh, Hydra in CO2 to 1. So those uh, images are not uh, consistent with the, uh, the assumption of this spherically symmetric circumstellar envelope. And this is also the case for RZ Sagittarius, which is the highest mass loss rate star uh, in our S star sample. And you can see also that for the red and the blue velocity, the emission kind of goes one way and then the other. Um, and we have not followed up those sources, but uh, we see that the emission is not consistent with a large scale spherical symmetry and uh, further uh, observations and also modeling will also be necessary to better understand the physical uh, phenomenon happening here. Um, so those are the data and the first result that I wanted to present. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Miora. And it's very brave to start this off. <laughs> uh, if there, is an, uh, there are a few minutes for questions. If you have a question, could you raise your hand on the, uh, on the participant list? On the... Don't feel shy, you are allowed to ask questions. Miura, yes. you say one third asymmetric, aspherical. How yes. aspherical? Well, we have, um, oops, sorry. So when we, for example, when we look at the major axis versus the minor axis ratio, we have some stars that have um, a ratio around 0 0.5. So I would say that's a spherical. Um, we also have those stars that show uh, outflows that don't uh, that are not consistent with a smooth uh, spherical symmetric distribution. So um, we also investigated if the 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 different shapes are linked to the the quality of the observations, and we ruled out those stars that we thought think maybe we miss flux or uh, have too high signal uh, too low signal to noise ratio. So those one third are the ones that we think. Um, show strong deviations. Yep. 
I'm quickly scrolling through the participant list to see that anyone else has, uh, has raised uh, a question. There are a couple of hands up. Yeah, Bruce, I don't see them. Uh, Maria. Okay, that, yeah. Um, Bruce. Well, that was a fantastic talk, and, and I love the work that you're doing. Excellent. Way to go. I have a question. I think the, you mentioned that the point of the survey is to estimate mass loss rates. I don't remember hearing you say too much about MDOT. Could you uh, uh, elucidate? Sorry, I, uh, I did not get the last Could you say a bit about the mass loss rates that you actually find? Okay, so we haven't done that yet because this is the first step of the project is first to uh, uh, have better constraints on the size and also uh, figure out if we uh, can use our methods on the stars, assuming the spherical symmetry. So we haven't done that yet. So that's the, the, the second step, the step of the project, and we will start that soon. But you have a, you. You, have a uh, you have a graph uh, with, with the m dot divided right. by the velocity. Yes, you can show that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Here there is log m dot divided by the velocity. Yes. So that's based on previous results. That's that's not what we calculated yet. Okay. Thank. Uh, Rajendra. Okay, so um, I've always been concerned about using uh, Gaussian to determine the size because clearly the actual brightness distribution may have a Gaussian with a tail, extended mm -hmm. tail. And so that would give you, and you know, those could, that could vary, possibly vary from star to star. And so you might get an incorrect size if you assume that the size is actually the full width half maximum of the Gaussian. So I'm wondering how we can take care of that kind of issue. I think we probably need detailed modeling, yes. uh, but yeah, I would like to have your reaction on that. Yes, so that's, that's true. Uh, the, the sizes that we derive here are, should be considered as the first estimate of the size, and we will do the modeling soon, and then we will have a better idea of the, the actual sizes. But yes, that's, that's correct. Okay, the next question is from Tomek. Can you hear me? Just about, Tomek. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was wondering about the environmental effect. Do you have any evidence of uh, uh, the size changing with the location in the galaxy? Well, I know that the stars are not uh, located along the plane, or not many of them, uh, but I don't know much about uh, the environment of each stars. So. Yes, I will have to look into that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, fair answer. <laughs> oh, final question, uh, Daniel, Tafoya. Daniel Tafoya? No, I think we've lost him. Um, Okay, well, we'll uh, end it here. There'll be a discussion um, later anyway. Thank you, Miora, for uh, kicking us off uh, so well. <laughs>